Hello again and welcome to chapter four of Earth Science, Plate Tectonics, A Scientific Revolution Unfolds. Now, this type, this chapter is pretty much what really got me into geosciences and why I decided to pursue that as a career. Um, I love the concepts, the big picture concepts of what we're going to talk about over the, and then sort of the, the effects of the plate tectonics, things like earthquakes and tsunamis and all that, which is a separate chapter. Uh, but let's get started and let's see how this goes. So the first initial hypothesis was actually called continental drift. Um, it was proposed by Alfred, uh, a German, I think, meteorologist, meteorologist, excuse me, um, in 1915, and he published a paper called The Origin of Continents and Oceans. Now, you know, this was received with, you know, lukewarm reception, and we'll get into that a bit more. But in a nutshell, what he had proposed is that at one time there was a supercontinent called Pangaea that began breaking up around 200 million years ago. And we'll show you the evidence that he used for that in a couple minutes, or in a couple slides, excuse me. And that the continents drifted to their present positions, and the continents broke through the ocean crust. Now, it's not perfect in it's the way it, uh, it's written. Obviously, we know a lot more now, but at the time, this was this was earth shattering. To use, <laughs> sorry about the pun. It was it was um, really ahead of its time. It really was. Uh, there were still a lot of people then that probably thought Earth was flat. Oh wait a minute, there still is. Never mind. <laughs> um, so th this idea kind of sat for a long time. It didn't really get noticed a whole lot until later, and I'll explain that as we go. So 200 million years ago, um, there was one large supercontinent for the most part called Pangaea. And you could see in the image there that North America, South America, Africa, Asia, I mean, they were all connected in some form or fashion for the most part. This is the way he had envisioned it all the way back in 1912. And that over time, the, they drift, the continents drifted into what their present positions were. Now, there were some flaws in this, and obviously, you know, the, again, being so far out there in terms of an idea, he wasn't quite able to explain everything. So the, what he used to actually try to um, show evidence for his theory was that the continents of South America and Africa fit together pretty much identically like jigsaw puzzle pieces. And then on top of that, you have fossils and rocks that match each other perfectly from one continent to another because they had to have been joined at one time. You have the fo same fossil on the east coast of South America as on the west coast of Africa. The same type of fossils, the same rock types, same structures. And the ancient climates had to have been identical in order to have those fossils and uh, you know rocks and everything because in order to have let's say a sedimentary rock like we talked about um, you have to have a depositional environment well that was found on on both continents what are both continents that are separated by an entire ocean now so at some point they had to have been joined based on this fossil rock and ancient climate evidence so you can see that and here's you know three three examples the mesosaurus was found on both Africa and um, South America, excuse me, I've been talking all day. You have Glossopteris, which is a type of plant that was found on all three continents. You can see it's found in Australia as well as fossils, okay? And then this Ly <laughs> Lystrosaurus, which I have no idea, it looks like an ancient walrus, that was also found on several of the continents separated by entire oceans. So, you know, when you're finding things in the same rock type and the same uh, climate, although even though they're separated by entire oceans, something's got to go, hey, wait a minute, you know, could there have possibly been a way for them to get from one landmass to another? And that's where he proposed his one big massive supercontinent, which we call Pangaea. In the early 1900s, this idea of continental drift was, you know, radical in terms of what they knew about geology at the time. And a lot of geologists completely just rejected this drift hypothesis mainly because you couldn't explain the mechanism as, as to how the actual continents moved. 
So how were they moving? How were they drifting? He couldn't explain that. So a lot of the geologists said, no, no, they said, no way, this can't be true. Well, more and more evidence came out, and we'll talk about that as we go, as to how, you know, especially in the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, that, wow, you know, this evidence came out, and this evidence, geophysical evidence, and it, it goes on and on and on to the point where now we pretty much use plate tectonics as the main paradigm, and it's not a theory anymore. It's pretty much been proven, other than a few tiny little exceptions, it, uh, plate tectonics ex has been completely and utterly accepted. So... Theory, the theory of plate tectonics is a bit more encompassing than just continental drift. And it's associated with the entire outer shell of the Earth's crust called the lithosphere. And that's, you know, the hard outer crunchy part of an otherwise sort of, you know, gushy inside part. Kind of like some candy. Like, um, I love mellow cups. So it's kind of like a mellow cup. It consists of several plates. There's, you know, uh, about seven or eight main plates and some micro plates. Um, that they're moving very slowly. However, they are moving and some are being built and some are being destroyed. And we'll talk about how that all works as we go along. The largest plate on earth is by far the, the Pacific plate, which encompasses most of the Pacific ocean. And most of the plates are underneath the ocean. They are not, you know, the land masses that we know of, the continents. Most of the plate is plates that are driven, you know, moving around on the earth are actually under the ocean. So here's a look at the uh, earth's lithospheric plates. And you can see most of them on here. You got the North American plate that we sit on here. You got the Eurasian plate, which is all of Europe and Russia. You got the African plate, the South American plate, the tiny little Caribbean plate. There's some smaller ones too. You got the Cocos plate right here, just off the coast of Mexico. Over on the other side of the world, we got the Philippine plate and then the Eurasian plate. There's some other ones too, uh, which you'll see in other uh, figures. A few other ones that are worth noting. Oh, I'm sorry, the Antarctic plate as well. The Scotia plate, which is a tiny little one here. So th there's, there's a lot of plates being jostled around and how that jostling occurs um, both dictates what type of phenomena is found there and and, and whether you know the, the crust is being created or destroyed or not at all either one neither one I should say so first we got to look at what's going on under the crust you know sort of that s soft marshmallowy stuff which we call the asthenosphere the asthenosphere is where is below the crust just below the crust before you hit the full mantle and underneath there, it's hotter and weaker than the lithosphere. Okay, so that because it's warm, that hot down there, we the the rocks start to almost act like a plastic as opposed to a rigid hard surface, which allows the plates to kind of move over them. So it's sort of what we call the conveyor belt system of how the plates move around. The, the asthenosphere is a much softer yet hotter the, the uh, crust sort of just floats along and it can move on top of it. And that's what allows for the motion of the lithosphere. That's that where it gets hard to say after a while. So there's three types of plate boundaries. And I really like this diagram. I know my face is covering part of it. So you have divergent boundaries, which are the red lines. You have convergent boundaries, which are the blue lines. And then you have transformed plate boundaries, which are the green lines. And I know I'm covering that. So let me explain over in the next several slides the differences between all those. But what you want to get out of this is the type of boundary dictates what's going to happen there. For example, trans they all form, you're going to get earthquakes at all of these, right? You can get earthquakes at divergent, convergent, or transform plate boundaries. However, the largest ones occur in the middle section there, the convergent plate boundaries. You can see the Pacific plate is huge and has several different kind of boundaries. On the western edge here, it's mostly blue or convergent. On the eastern edge, you can see it's mostly red or divergent. And then you got some areas in here which are transformed, like the San Andreas Fault, where you have just two, two um, uh, faults slipping, or excuse me, two plates sliding past one another. And we're going to discuss all these in detail as we go. So you can see some patterns that are taking place here. 
um, around the world. The first type of plate boundary we're going to look at is divergent plate boundaries or constructive margins. And what do we mean by that? This is where new crust, the youngest crust on Earth, is being made. So the, it's coming up, the new crust is coming up, and it bubbles over, so to speak, creates the plate. The plate moves apart a little bit, more bubbles up, it moves apart, and it keeps doing that. So the mantle is just below, just below, which is like 8, 9, 10 kilometers down, the new seafloor. It's the thin. So where this new crust is being made is some of the thinnest crust on Earth because it's the closest to the mantle both in depth in the ocean and where the actual mantle material is coming out is only, you know, 10 kilometers down. Whereas like, you know, in the Himalayas, the mantle would be like 40 kilometers down because <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's sitting very deep like an iceberg. We'll show you that in a bit. So this is where you find the ocean ridges and the seafloor spreading. Again, the seafloor spreads apart, new mantle material comes out, spreads apart, uh, comes out spreads apart and it keeps doing this over and over and over again and then it pushes everything aside as it goes so that the ocean is actually getting bigger in a divergent plate zone so continental rifts form at the spreading centers so they're actually higher in relief so we call that the, like the mid-atlantic ridge is a mountain range right where the mantle material is coming out because that's where it's kind of being piled up and it, it this ridge is like a snake that runs it's the longest continuous mountain chain in the world. So here's the here's the North America plate. So this we're over on this side. Here's Europe over here, and you have this Mid-Atlantic Ridge that spans all. It goes much further than that. So what happens is you have this partial melting of the crust. It comes up and then it moves this way. Comes up and it moves that way. Okay, so it's it's bubbling up and pushing everything aside and bubbling up and pushing everything aside. So the, the rocks that are formed here and here just on the other each side of the uh, the mid Atlantic Ridge are way younger than these way over here, which have been pushed for millions of years. So th these are essentially brand new rocks. These are much older. It gets older as you go away from the ridge. Now, con convergent plate boundaries are what we call destructive margins. That's where two plates are colliding with one another, and there's two different options for that. You have um, oceanic convergence, or, or excuse me, oceanic continental convergence, uh, where you have, so oceanic material is much denser. It's made of mostly basalt, and it sinks down below one plate, and it goes down like a big slab underneath the other plate. And uh, you get things like vo continental volcanic arcs, and I'll show you pictures of that. So th the Andes Mountains are a perfect example of that. You have the Nazca Plate, which is going down beneath the South American Plate. And when that happens, it starts to melt that material that's down underneath there. It melts it as it goes deeper. And that melted material rises up and creates a volcanic chain. You see this all over the world. The Andes, the Cascades, the Sierra Nevadas, the Aleutian Islands in, in Alaska, Japan is the same thing, Mount Fuji. Those are all um, volcanic arc uh, type of, uh, those volcanoes wouldn't be there if it wasn't subduction. Now, uh, the Andes, Cascades, and Sierra Mountain is where you have ocean plate diving beneath a continental plate. But you also have other forms of that, like um the oceanic oceanic which i'll get to in a second so here's an example of oceanic continental convergence so you have this plate here this is the juan de fuca plate off the coast of oregon and washington diving beneath the north american plate so here's where the actual trench is here that's the low point where it's kind of where they're kind of rubbing up against each other and then once this slab gets deep enough it starts to melt and come up as a volcanic arc and you can see there's several volcanoes. You got Mount Hood, you know, and there's a whole ring of them like this, or it's not a ring, a line of them, excuse me. Now the distance between this trench and where the actual um, volcanoes are gives you an indication as to how steep or how shallow that subduction is taking place. If it's really shallow, it takes longer for this plate to get down to this depth, so it's going to be further away. So this is a pretty shallow subduction. 
all subduction is shallow. They add vertical exaggeration in these figures, but this is really shallow. Only a couple of degrees between, you know, a couple of degrees as it's going down here to get melted. In other areas of the world, like the Mar Marianas Trench, which is the deepest trench in the world, the trench and the islands are almost right next to each other because it's very steep. So it's not taking nearly as long for that slab, that subducting slab to get down to these temperatures where it's gonna start to melt and then create that earth, uh, excuse me, that volcano. Now, there's also oceanic oceanic convergence where you have two ocean plates slamming into each other. Something's gotta give, one of them goes down beneath another and then descends into the earth, just like the one before. And you still get volcanoes. A lot of them are only on the ocean floor, but sometimes they do come to the surface in areas like I mentioned before, the Aleutian Islands, the Marianas Islands, or the Tonga Islands. Now, if you look at all three of those places, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't, but just know this, some of the largest earthquakes that occur around the world occur in those three spots because there's so much uh, subduction taking place. There's also some massive volcanoes in those areas that can go off as well. So here's an example of ocean-ocean convergence. You have the Pacific plate, which is moving sort of in this direction, north-northeast, and it's diving beneath the North American plate, which is here. Let me erase that real quick. Forming this trench, this is the, whoops, this is the trench here, this dark line, this is the trench. So everything on the lower half here is diving beneath everything on the upper half here and that creates this archipelago of volcanoes. And there's a whole bunch of them in there. Some of them have really done some damage depending on uh, where they are. I remember uh, readout here, um, I don't remember how long ago that was. That one, uh, the, one of the problems with these volcanoes is this is right where a lot of the transcontinental air flights are. So when there's massive volcano eruptions, they have to reroute flights or cancel flights because airplanes can't fly through that. It'll literally stop the engine. So they gotta be very careful with that. So when, you know, when there's any type of volcano like this, they have to go around it. So a lot of Japan, California, or Japan, New York flights, they go like this, so they go over towards the North Pole because the Earth is round and it's quicker than going straight like this. Hopefully that makes sense to you. But the point is, is when there's volcanic eruptions in this part of the world, this is the this is Alaska right here. When there's big Earth, or excuse me, uh, volcanic eruptions, a lot of times air traffic has to be uh, rerouted around it. Beautiful volcanoes though. So the final type of pl convergent plate boundary or destructive margin is where two continents are sort of slamming into each other. We have continent starting to uh, subduct, then it meets another continent. And the only thing that can really happen is everything goes up. And the best example on earth of this is the Himalayas. So over time, like millions of years ago, India was moving in this direction straight towards Eurasia. So at one time there was probably an ocean right here, but that got that got subducted and closed up. Eventually, India plows into Eurasia with such force it creates the tallest mountain range on Earth. It just shoved everything up because it has nowhere else to go. So it took 71 million years, but India managed to force you know that all that land up. That's a very very interesting geologic area. Um, my master's thesis dealt with. Um, it's just off this map here. It's like right here on this map, the small map. That's where China blows off its nukes. And so I had to kind of describe the, all of the geology that's taking place. This is the largest, the tallest mountain range in the world. That's the Himalayas. Then you have the Tibetan Plateau here. Okay, that's where all those mountains are. It's, at, it's way up in the air. It just took this whole big pile of land and pushed it straight up. Then you have another thing called a basin. So it bent it behind there. So it went up, then back down. This is the Tarim Basin. And then back here, you can't see it, it's just off the map, is the Alton Tog, uh, Alton Shan, excuse me, Alton Shan Mountains, which is the tallest mountain range that's the furthest from any type of plate boundary. Why is that a big deal? Well, there was so much energy in this collision, it essentially created 
two mountain ranges, not just one. So that's why this is geologically so interesting is because it's just a massive force. And the thing is, it's still occurring. The Himalayan mountains are still growing. They are not shrinking. They are still going up ever so slightly. So it's a really interesting, interesting place to do geology. Now, the last type of plate boundary is what we call a transform boundary or transform plate boundary, where you have one plate sliding past another. So there's no plate being destroyed or um, created. They're simply sliding past one another. Now, um, a lot of times, most of the, the transform boundaries are found in the ocean along and they join the seg the segments join at the mid ocean ridge. That's where the bulk of it is. Um, but what this does is it helps move oceanic crust material in a lateral sense. So as it's coming out, it has to go somewhere and it creates these breaks or what we call transform boundaries. Now, the most obvious example of this is the San Andreas Fault in California. So here we go. The, this is um, a kind of an interesting off the west coast. It, the the west coast of uh, uh, the United States, you have a whole bunch of boundaries taking place in a small area. You have a convergent boundary. So this is subduction up here off the coast of Oregon and Washington. And that's what created Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier. But then it like quickly gradates into a transform boundary here. OK, and that's the San Andreas Fault. So along the San Andreas Fault, they're not being pulled apart or smushed together. They're strictly sliding past one another. You know, it's funny because I get asked all the time because I do earthquake stuff. When is, you know, Southern California going to fall into the ocean? Well, it's not going to fall into the ocean. Los Angeles sits on a sliver of the Pacific plate that's actually above sea level. So it's actually moving this way. And San Francisco, which is right here, is technically sort of moving that way. So in about 30 million years, Los Angeles and, and uh, San Francisco will be neighbors. That's what's going to happen. That would be funny, though, wouldn't it? But they're not, they're not being destroyed. They're just simply moving past one another along what's called a transform plate boundary, which we call the San Andreas Fault. So plates and boundaries migrate and they're created and destroyed. And you see that in the rock record as well, because like when in the image with India going into Eurasia, there was at once a shallow sea between those two. But because everything was being subducted, it eventually closed that ocean and then created that collision. OK, so when the Pangaea first started breaking up, the first ocean that really started to form as it split apart was the Atlantic. When everything was the Pangaea, the Atlantic didn't exist. So the Atlantic, in, in, in a way, is a very new, much newer ocean than some of the other ocean. And you can see that over time. I'm not going to go through all this. So starting in A here, they're all connected. And what you see is you'll start to see Africa. It, things start to split up over here in Australia. And then you, you'll see the small gap here. And, and see, and, and then now you're just see, starting to see the Atlantic grow and grow and grow into where it is today. So the Pacific plate is not growing. It's actually shrinking, although it's still massive. It's not growing. It's shrinking. So over, uh, it's, uh, you don't really see it on this particular diagram. But on, uh, on the western edge over here, you have the Nazca plate, which is just off the coast of South America. That's what created the Andes. So it's pushing into the South America, and, but it's also pushing away from South America, which pushes the overall direction of the Pacific plate in a northeast fashion, or excuse me, northwest fashion towards Japan and Russia and uh, Alaska. And so it's actually being, it's being created, but it's being um, destroyed faster than it's being created. They started to test the theory of plate tectonics. And one of the ways they did that is by drilling into the ocean, you know, the ocean crust that is. So when you do that, you can age date the sediments and then the thickness of the seafloor sediments. And that helps verify that. So if you're right next to the, right next to the uh, mid-ocean mid ridge, there's almost no sediments. The rock is being formed right there. 
But as it goes away, you start to get more and more sediments that drift down. And as you get way off to the sides, you get lots and lots of sediments. So it's essentially building in thickness as you move away from the mid ocean ridge. So that's why the th they can verify that, hey, this has to be the newest rock because there's almost no sediments, whereas those way away from the mid-ocean ridge, those are the thickest rocks, or excuse me, the thickest sediments, and yet so they're the oldest ones. The other thing that they were able to do too, and uh, there might be a slide for this, but I'll, I'll, I'm just going to mention is, um, uh, the mag magnetic stripes. I think there's a slide for that, so I'll, I'll leave that for the slide. But in addition to the ocean drilling, um, th they go in, they drill and drill, and you could see how right here, here's the motor ocean, the ridge right here. So you can see it's super thin right at the edge of the, the ridge, and then as you go further out, they get thicker. And you could see that in the drilling, all the drilling. And they then they correlate that so they match up everything and you can see that it gets very narrow right at the ridge. So they know that these are much older out here because they've had out at the edge because they've had time to develop these sediment beds. Another test of the plate tectonics model is what are known as hot spots or mantle plumes. These are caused by rising molten material from the deep in the earth and the thing with those is they kind of stay in one spot. They're stationary. And that lended more evidence to the plate tectonic theory. And a, the best example of that is the Hawaiian Islands. So I, I don't know if you're going to get my uh, <laughs> my analogy here. So you have this stationary, stationary plume, which is my finger down here. And then so it burns a hole through the crust. Then the crust moves. And then it burns another hole and another hole and another hole and it keeps burning holes through the crust because the crust is still moving it creates a chain of islands so if you look at the hawaiian islands there's what six or seven that you can see and then if you look as you go north off the coast of um, hawaii there's plenty more that go uh, way off and you can even see where the plate changed direction and so they could work backwards to figure out where the plate had been at one time and how fast it moved based on the dates of the uh, rocks. So the Hawaiian Islands are a hotspot. So is um, uh, Yellowstone is a hotspot. There's always this, that's why we have the geysers and everything there. Um, there's a couple places in Africa that are hotspots. Um, uh, Iceland is a hotspot, excuse me. Um, so there, there's, you have this big ball of heat that's below the surface and it just kind of stays there, but the plate moves over it constantly burning new holes into the crust. So here's what I mentioned. So here's where we are today. You could see this chain here and then this chain here. And obviously somewhere along here, the plate changed direction. So they can move backwards in time to see how long it took. So based on their ages of the in the dates, it goes back about uh, 80 million years. Okay, so if you look at just the Hawaiian Islands, so this is the, you know, the quote unquote youngest island, although there's a new one being formed offshore. And then you have Maui, and then you have Molokai, Oahu, and Kauai. And as you go west, these this one is, you know, much older than the, the island it is now because the plates keeps moving over this big old hot spot underneath it. Fascinating stuff. I love it. <laughs> Now, I mentioned this before, another uh, evidence for the plate tectonics model is what we call paleomagnetism, which is ancient magnetism. Um, and this, is, this was done post-World War II when they developed a lot of the technology that they could go down and do this stuff with submarines and submersibles. They, they found out is that, hey, you know, our magnetic polarity has switched back and forth. Like right now, if you hold a compass in your hand, it points north. It hasn't always been that way. There were many times in Earth's past where the magnetic field had pointed south, okay, which would be really odd, but it has happened, and it's happened many times, this reversal. Now, you take that, and when you look at it on each side of the uh, spreading center of the mid-Atlantic ridge in the ocean, 
they match up so that this one, like where we are right now, they all face north. And then some odd time ago, they both face south. Then they both face north, south, north. And they, it goes out like that. And because of that, they said, hey, there has to be a pattern here that these are spreading equally. They have to be moving. There's no way you could have a north, uh, a north compass and a south compass at the same time. So these had to have been formed at different times under different polarities. So that's why we call it Earth's magnetic revert field reversals. Now that would be awfully weird if that happened. We don't know how it happens exactly, um, and, you know, or how long it takes to happen. Is it like in a day or something, or how long that takes? But um, so we know though that when the Earth, when these rocks formed. The magnetic, any magnetic material that was in there sort of glommed on to Earth's magnetic field and was sort of frozen that way. And then maybe for the, you know, for a couple million years as it hardened, then all of a sudden if there was a, uh, it started facing south, all the rocks that are being formed there glom onto that magnetic field and they face south for a while and then north and then south. So it, it was very compelling evidence. And a lot of this was done in the 60s. Um, like I said, post-World War II, they, you know, they had, that's where a lot of the technology that was able to do this was being developed. <clears throat> so polar wandering is the idea that over time we see where the sort of the poles were. And it's not that the pole is wandering per se, it's that the plates underneath them have shifted. That's why we call it apparent polar wandering. It's not that the pole is after actually moving that much. Um, because it can't, the earth is spinning on its axis. It has to be somewhat near, you know, as it spins, it has to be somewhat near that axis. But in the rock record, we see that there are different, where the rocks, anything with magnetic field attached to it, they're pointing in a specific direction. And what that means is um, you could, you get different polar wanderings, but they kind of sort of follow that same, that same path in terms of, okay, at, you know they're facing the same direction and what that that's telling us is that when you reconstruct that when you go backwards in time it's telling you hey these plates had to have been here during this point and then here during this point and here during this point because there's no way from 200 million years ago you can see this one here two, this is for uh, North America for 200 million years ago and then 300 million years ago they're in completely different spots something had to have changed was it the pole no the pole didn't change that much but the placement of the continents did over those millions of years and that like i mentioned before the magnetic reversals and seafloor spreading was a huge leap forward and sort of saying hey this is actually something that's occurring so you have these mag like i said at divergent you have magma it gets pushed out in each direction and over time, when it first cools, when that rock first cools, it grabs onto the Earth's magnetic field. If the Earth's magnetic field flips, then it has to, you know, it flips, it cools in that direction, and you get these magnetic stripes. And you see these as plain as day on both sides of the spreading ridge going out in time. There are different techniques to be able to actually measure this plate motion. And one of the things, like I mentioned earlier, was hotspot tracks, where you have the Hawaiian Islands, which you see above the ocean, but then as you go back in time, everything's below the ocean, and then you see this change in direction. That's called the Emperor Seamount Chain. And you can use that to sort of backtrack to figure out, based on uh, radiometric dating of the rocks, how long that it, um, has been going in that direction and then the current direction it's going in. So it gives you a, a better understanding of to how old things are. There's also space age technology um, to directly measure things like very long baseline interferometry, which I'm not gonna go into it, but the idea is sort of taking um, uh, before and after pictures and uh, basing it how the, uh, the, the spectrums look back to the, to the uh, they look different. You could see um, how much things have moved. And then nowadays with global positioning systems, it's even easier to track this 
because we have so many GPS satellites up there. Any movements that are taking place, they take measurements all the time. So, they, you know, you have sort of that before and after picture. So there are, you know, the technology has gotten really good at being able to figure out exactly how fast one plate is moving relative to another. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the directions and rates of plate motions is similar to you know boiling of water what we call convection currents so they're they're circular currents that go out from a, a spreading ridge and they go out in each direction bringing up the warmer water moving it cooling it bringing up the warmer water you know and it's no different you could imagine this as this is the mid atlantic ridge this hot magma comes up from down here moves out that direction it moves out that direction creating new um a new oceanic crust there's no one model that explains all facets of facets of plate tectonics um, there are, even with plate tectonics there's a few phenomena that's been found around the world that plate tectonics just doesn't um, you know can't explain perfectly it does explain most of it like 98 percent of it and what drives this whole plate tectonics theory is the heat within the Earth's, you know, under the uh, under the crust. That's the driving force. So there's several models that have been proposed, things like slab pull and ridge push. Um, so as you know, like in the convection currents that you just saw with the water, as the, the the crust comes up and it overflows, it's pushing out the sides, creating the new crust. So that's sort of the ridge push part of it. And then as a plate is subducting down into the earth, that weight of that slab is pulling it along with it. So it's sort of gravity driven um, down into the uh, man upper mantle. So you can look see this on this type of uh, diagram. Here you have the upwelling of the heat creating the ridge push coming out on each side. And then as you get towards a trench here, the weight of this subducted slab just starts to keep pulling it. So it's a combination, it's a pull push. Again, this is one theory that they have. It's being pulled into the earth because that slab is colder than the surrounding area. So the cold, the cold slab sinks into sort of this warm, gushy stuff. Um, and that's a huge driving force for you know keeping this sort of convection you can think of it like one sort of big convection cell here with my awesome diagrams and um, what's crazy is those slabs can get very deep and sometimes even what can happen is they can break off or what we call a detached slab and that's exactly what happened in the Tonga region so you can see earthquakes you can see it in the uh, in the earthquake record where you have this plate going down a chunk breaks off and the chunk down there even deeper can actually cause an earthquake it's it's pretty crazy stuff not only that they can, the fact that they can tell that um i love geophysics <laughs> so the you know the, the the subduction pull is a great force because you got all of this crust going down into the earth what actually drives the plate motion is the mantle plumes all that heat underneath at the mantle core boundary that causes convection so even deeper in the earth where you're getting near the core of the earth there's so much heat that heat has to go somewhere and heat rises and it comes up it wells up gets up near the base the bottom of the crust and heats that crust and allows it you know to get sort of mushy like i mentioned before and allows it to it gives it sort of that uh, push it needs to go uh, to grow apart at the spreading ridges and then obviously when it's subducting it because it's sort of that molten mushy stuff it allows the cold um, subducting slab to sort of knife through it so it's a double-edged thing where we have this whole mantle convection let me show you an example of that there are sort of two kind of models to look at how this occurs. You have the layering at 660 kilometers, which is sort of this dark area here. Now within that is the upper mantle or what we call the asthenosphere, where it's very sort of plasticky and it's sort of the driving force to help move the plates along. 
However, the heat for that driving force is coming from massive convection currents that occur within the mantle itself. And you can see that here, this mega plume that comes up. Maybe I should use a different color since this is all red. This mega plume that right here that kind of comes up from the core, heating everything up, and then creates an island chain. You can see here. So you have this chain of islands because that mantle, this mega plume, is just sitting there essentially stationary while the plates move over it and burning those holes in it, like I mentioned. And you see that. Uh, so this is one idea that you have this sort of rising mantle plumes with this discontinuity thing here at 660 kilometers that creates sort of the upper edge of the convection current. Now you can see in this image here, you see this downward placing of, um, of uh, mantle material. Now, once you get deep enough, it's very difficult to create what's called brittle deformation. Now, all that means is the, the rock gets so hot, it acts like plastic as opposed to a rock. So when you get super deep, the rock is too mushy to create earthquakes. So I'm bringing this, I always bring it back to earthquakes to show you how the, they, they play a role with each other. So these super subducted slabs down there, they, you can only get earthquakes down to a certain depth. In fact, 660 kilometers is about as deep as you're going to get because but anything after that, everything's just sort of plasticky. It, it can't break enough to create an earthquake. The other option that's been proposed is what's called whole mantle convection, where you have this layer cake model with essentially two disconnected convection currents. You have the one that takes place in what's called the asthenosphere, like we mentioned before. So the heat rises up, it comes in, creates, and goes in this sort of circular fashion. You also have the mant upper mantle plumes, which are these right here, which create the hot spots. So all that heat is actually sitting in the upper mantle or the asthenosphere, not further down in this sort of mega plume structure. And then you have very sluggish or slow movement coming off of the actual core itself. It's there, but it's super slow. And what we see in, in, the, in the earthquake record is, you know, once you get down to that 660 kilometer range here, like I mentioned in the previous slide, you start to get, you can't get earthquakes anymore because there's no brittle deformation. So that's where this model kind of comes in, where, you know, one, uh, the slabs don't make it really past that 660 kilometer range. They just start getting assimilated, assimilated and melted down. So that's sort of the, the idea behind the two. One takes place throughout the mantle. One is taking place mostly at the upper mantle. That's with the actual plate motion, but the entire mantle itself is convecting, although slowly, to create the heat. Well, that was a pretty quick synopsis on plate tectonics. Again, this is near and dear to me. I love this stuff. That's why I got into geology. Now, you take all of this and you start looking at all the other things that are associated with it, like earthquakes I've been mentioning, volcanoes, and then obviously tsunamis. And I mean, this all plays a role into plate tectonics, and that's why I love this stuff so much. Um, I know this is a bit of a quick video. I'm a little behind as usual. I got lots going on. I hope you learned something out of my little lecture out of this. Um, by all means, go look at this stuff some more. It's really interesting. And uh, the moral of the story is Alfred Wagner back in 1915 has been more than vindicated. The play tectonics model that he sort of envisioned with continental drift has come to fruition and is, is globally accepted now. Um, again, there's still some theories, different theories about the plate motions in terms of the driving forces, but overall, all of the evidence points to the plates Move, being jostled around, moved over millions of years into their current position, and in millions of years, they'll be in possibly a whole nother um, position. All right, thank you, and we'll see you in the next chapter.